Um, this is actually a shot um, that was taken at 101,000 feet by a friend of ours um, who runs a company in California called JP Aerospace. And he is about launching satellites uh, using helium balloons to elevate to extreme altitudes and then from that platform a rocket fires um, and can launch the satellite. So he thought it would be fun to uh, launch our logo one day. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're getting up there bit by bit. It is my sincere hope to make it into space by one means or another, preferably not as ash. I, I, I really don't want to do the sky route. You'd rather actually be uh, around to enjoy the trip. Um, but John, John Powell of JP Aerospace is a great example of the kind of guys I'm going to be talking about tonight. Many people that I've had or interviewed or have involved in our various documentaries over the years. Scientists, engineers, inventors, um, gadflies and curmudgeons, uh, many of whom work in their garages or basements and have been doing this kind of stuff on their own over the years and achieving some rather wonderful results. Even in large organizations like NASA, you sometimes encounter a situation where the last thing in the world that you thought was going to be a mission critical component or something that was actually particularly important turns out to be a lifesaver. Um, with that in mind, let me ask you if any of you can identify this. And yes. And it's even a ballpoint pen, uh, which is significant actually because um, when I was a kid, the ballpoint pen was a novelty. It was a World War II invention. I was born a few years after World War II, but not very many, and we weren't allowed to use these things in school. When we finally got to write with ink, we had to use fountain or cartridge pens. That's just to indicate I'm really, really old, and that's all we're going to say about that. But obviously, I have a reason for putting this one up here, so I'm looking for a more specific identification than just it being a pen. Yes, sir. One of those pens that you can write upside down. Right? That's exactly what it is. This is a Fisher Zero G $10 million development rights in space or on any angle pen, but it's more than that. It is a lunar excursion module ignition. We'll get to that in a moment. Because um, as I say, I, I, I think I've already pointed out I'm a fairly old guy. I grew up in what may have been, you know, the, the last golden age of heroes. Here were mine. The original Mercury 7 astronauts. Uh, selected in 1959, Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, Gordon Cooper, Wally Shira, Deke Slayton, I have to check, John Glenn, and Scott Carpenter, um, many of whom show up in our, our, our various films. These guys, of course, came out of Right Stuff Central. They were test pilots. They came out of an era where their jobs and their lives were just stunningly dangerous, more so than even being astronauts. Uh, the statistic that gets bandied about is that during the age of experimental jet uh, test flight, which was right after World War II and well into the 50s, pretty much until uh, the early 1960s, every one of these folks, and they were all test pilots, had a one in four chance of dying on any given mission. And they had to go up every morning, often hungover, and do this over and over and over again. Um, and those odds were not daunting. I've often been asked why if this was a braver generation than ours. I don't think so. If you ask any of them, they will tell you that they grew up in the Depression. They fought in World War II or Korea, the, the younger ones, uh, ended up as test pilots. And when the opportunity came along to become Mercury astronauts initially, which of course they all did, um, that was almost a walk in the park for these guys. It was a pretty cushy gig. Now, Having said which, I'm going to show you a couple of clips. The way we're going to do this, and I have no idea whether this is going to work out or not, um, is I'm going to kind of natter for a bit and then throw to a clip or two from one of our uh, films. And I'd like to show you a couple right now. Um, and this looks like the first one, so let's just see if it's going to play. This is... Um, so you got to drag it on. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Drag it over, we're going to stick it up there. I guess I'm going to have to do this every time. And uh, let's see if the darn thing play. Let's find out. Uh, if I've lined this up correctly, this is going to be um, Scott Crossfield, uh, who was one of those 
uh, test pilots. He was actually a NASA test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base. You've all heard of Chuck Yeager. You've probably all heard of Scott Crossfield. But you know who everyone here knows who Chuck Yeager is? He's still around. Um, Chuck was, among other things, the guy who broke the sound barrier in 1947 in the Bell X-1. And that inspired all kinds of pilots and rat racers to head out to Edwards Air Force Base in the high desert of California, uh, looking to work with Chuck and also looking to bust his record. And one of these guys was Scott Crossfield, uh, who died not too long ago. He's shown up in a lot of our films. He was the first guy to hit Mach 2. Um, so let's have a look at the first of two clips with Scott and Chuck. The Air Force was planning to uh, fly the X-1A in excess of Mach 2. So that wouldn't be kind of cute if the, if the Navy airplane went Mach 2 first. You know, it would be kind of cute to bump the Jaeger off his bump for a day or two because that's all it could last. <laughs> It was a kind of an interesting day. I had the flu very badly and felt like sin, but I wouldn't have bought to give up on this one, one opportunity. We filled the airplane with propellant. We cleaned up the exterior of the airplane and took every protuberance off of it we could. We taped every crack. We didn't know whether this would help or not. If it did, fine, it wasn't going to hurt anything. Fortunately, it was a cold day. The winds were right aloft to give me a little boost going through wind shear at that altitude. I knew exactly the direction I wanted to go to get that little kick. Crossfield's extra efforts paid off as the Douglas skyrocket inched just above Mark 2.0. This time, the press was allowed to notice. Scott, he's, you know, he's probably a pretty good pilot. So they got up, up to Mach 2, barely. And uh, 2.005 or something like that. And I think they may have fudged factor a little bit, but that may be different. Anyway, we're sitting there with the, the X-1A. It's different from the X-1. The X-1 had two and a half minutes of power. The X-1A had four and a half minutes of power. Jack Ridley worked out a profile, said, you drop it 30,000 feet, fire off three of your four chambers, accelerate out to 0.8 Mach, climb 45, level up 45, fire off fourth rocket, go 1.1, pull the airplane up into about a 50 degree climb angle, and go to 70,000 feet, and 70,000, start pushing over, level out, and then run the thing till it runs out of fuel. He said, we, I, I think you can get above 2.3 Mach. And so I went above 70 on the pushover, up to about 78,000 feet, and man, we were really accelerating. As I went through 2.3 Mach, the airplane began to yaw. I couldn't understand it. As I looked, I said, this is not, not right. I used rudder to try to get the nose back, but nothing out, and it yawed it, and finally pitched up, and then it really, really start tumbling. Yeager was falling out of the sky with all the aerodynamics of a set of keys, locked in a flat spin at more than twice the speed of sound. He blacked out when his helmet cracked the canopy. 80,000 feet to 25,000 feet in 51 seconds, and tumbling. And, and finally, I ended up in this inverted spin. Well, spins were a way of life with us. We spun everything. So I flipped it into normal spin, and popped it out of the normal spin at 25,000 feet and looked around, I was over to Hatchby. I landed uh, on lake bed and uh, that was the last flight I made in the airplane. And, and basically, that just shows guys with experience can do things that pilots without experience can do. I don't, I don't know why, why Jaeger did that because uh, we all knew that was gonna happen. I, I don't have any idea why he went charging out like that. To, the Bell guy said, hey, we don't know what's going on here much above Mach 2 or 2.3. We think we may be running into a stability problem according to wind tunnel data. We had the same problem on the D558 too. All the airplanes in those days configurations would have that so-called supersonic yaw. Chuck Yeager had survived the worst the sky over Edwards could throw at him. But as he prepared to move on, a new set of challenges and a new frontier were beckoning. 